Tell me she got the video of the baptisms. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we're, we're still in Matthew. It's been, what, three weeks since we did the introduction to yes. Matthew? Mm -hmm. So uh, t today what I'm planning on doing is getting through like chapter 8 or verse 18, not chapter 18, verse 18 all the way through the rest of chapter 1, and then we can actually get ready for chapter 2. So nothing like talking about the Christmas story. So just <laughs> in... in almost summer at this point, spring. Um, just so you guys know, like I wrote these notes for this of going through this two weeks ago and still haven't had the chance to, because like two weeks ago we had, there were those fires and the Arnolds had to go off and deal with that. And so we ran children's ministry. Last week was the thing with Walk to Emmaus. And so I've looked over them, but I, it's been two weeks since I've studied all of this. Um, let me review a little bit about the book of Matthew and we'll, we'll get started. So Matthew, big things, claims that he's going to make in this book, that Jesus is the Messiah from David, right? the one that 2 Samuel 7 is promised that everyone's going to come from your throne, it's going to reign on the throne forever, this whole promise, um, and that he's also from Abraham. So David, Abraham, he's the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham, the fulfillment of the prophecy to David, all of this is coming forth in Jesus, um, that he teaches with the same authority that Moses taught with, he's going to take the law and he's going to, Matthew chapter 5 is going to be this whole re-giving of the law. You've heard it said, but I tell you, and he's just playing with rebuilding this whole law. And Matthew's going to build this whole idea of Emmanuel, God with us, and why this whole matters. So, the whole thing matters. So we talked about Old Testament references and looking for people who accept and don't accept and meditating on it all. Today we're just going to talk about this opening story of the, the birth story. Um, so let me let me read, starting in verse 18, and then we'll kind of walk through a little bit and see, see where we land there. The birth of Jesus Christ came about in this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to, engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. There it is. These stories, I love them, but let's be real. What happens in the church is we get so familiar with stuff like this that it just becomes like the normal thing that we do, and, and we miss out, I think, gravity-wise. And maybe gravity is the word. We miss out on the weirdness of the Bible's weird. Do you guys ever read the Bible and think it's weird? Um, I'm reading a book right now I was uh, called How Not to Read the Bible by a guy named Dan Kimball. And one of the things he says is when he, when he reads his Bible, he has different highlighters. And so like yellow is this is important, remember it. Um, green is something else. And purple is this is weird and I don't understand it. And he's like, and I'll just be honest, this is a guy that's been a pastor for years. There's a lot of purple in my Bible. <laughs> like there's just a lot of purple. Um, and if you get out of context or out of familiarity and you read stories like this, it's, it's weird. Um, th this is the story of how God himself enters into the world. It's a great story. I would not have written it like this. I wouldn't have put it in there this, this way. So let me set some context. And you guys know this stuff too. But we'll set a little bit of context here and we'll play with it some. So uh, town Mary and Joseph are from is the town called? Nazareth. There we go. Don't, don't say bye-bye. Nobody -bye. <laughs> like, got that right. Nobody say it right. Yeah. Did I spell that right? Nazareth? No, here's my problem. I can't spell. That's right. Okay, good deal. Got it. I'm always scared. That's like, if, if a red squiggly line doesn't pop off, you know, that's how it goes. We don't know whether we spell it. So, so Nazareth, and, and I did a sermon series about this, so not last Christmas, but Christmas before last. Big town or small town? Small. It is, it is like Podunk Central. So uh, most historians and archaeologists and people that go back and dig up old towns and try to figure out, 
they set the population around 500. Damn. So you have five, 500 people. So you think, I don't know, Dora, Elida, they, they probably operate around that population. Are they bigger or smaller? They're smaller, smaller. They're smaller than that. Okay, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. Maybe PepsiCo might be closer to the 500. Maybe. The big, the big thing with Nazareth is, is Nazareth is, the word Nazareth means stick. We talked about this a little bit. It's out of the sticks. It's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's not like they have truck routes and trains and gas stations and convenience stores that are bringing in goods to, to help take care of the population there. When you're that far out, you have to be a self-sustaining population. Like you within your 500 people have to have someone that's an expert at hunting and finding food and killing things or raising animals. You have to have someone that's an expert in doing burial preparations and you, you know, you only got 500 people. Someone's got to do different jobs and the way you would do trade in a town like that, right? Is you go to the baker and you say, if you'll break me bread, I'll give you one of my sheep. I don't know. Like this is, mm-hmm. this is how it works, right? We, we are so unfamiliar with that type of world in modern America. We'll get tastes of it from time to time. But so that being said, how well do people know each other in Nazareth? Yeah. We know each other pretty well. The other thing is when you start talking about traditional Jewish like wedding ceremonies, who who are the deciders in a Jewish wedding? Parents. The parents, family. Yeah. So it is determined by parents. And usually these types of relationships of, of playing matchmaker and getting this all set up. This is something that's going to have been... Is matchmaker not the right word? No, I, I, it made me think of something. Wedding else. is wedding... Oh, there's another D there. We could do welding. <laughs> yeah. Jewish wedding ceremonies. Okay. Right. I have random thoughts that pop in my head. It wasn't you. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> you can tell me. I have random thoughts that pop up in mine as well. But pa- parents are the... They, they are the ones that are the driving force behind this marriage. And they have probably, and I'm giving some interpretation here, just historical context stuff, but I I think this is accurate. They have probably been working out contracts for this marriage for years. I mean, you're talking, oh, this person over here had a baby about the same time we had a baby. Um, We really like what their family stands for and what they believe. And so we had a girl, they had a boy. This is probably going to be in the workings. And it sounds foreign to us, but Mary and Joseph are three years old. And their parents are probably already, one of these days, where these two kids are going to get married. And it's not like Mary and Joseph had any say in it, because it wasn't their decision to make. Mm-hmm. So this is something that's been set up for years. It's been in the contract phase, things are working. Now they get into their mid to late teens. So, Can I ask a question? Yeah. I've always heard that he was a lot older than yeah. that. Yeah, people say that. And that could possibly be too. That's another historical thing that he may have very well been... Because the other thing, too, is he would have needed to be old enough to go and prepare a house mm-hmm. and have that. So I mean, but still, like, that could still be the case. They don't have to be the same age yeah, as their parents. Yeah, yeah you're exactly yeah, right. But, yeah, but I was just curious, like, yeah. Yeah. if that was accurate. There are, so in the, uh, in the Muslim tradition, they actually place Joseph as significantly older than Mary. Like they, he's four yeah, like, 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 way like yeah. fifty or sixty, and she's fourteen. Yeah, wow. and that's and that's yeah, normal. Yeah, I don't think he would be that old. No, he, like, come of age at thirteen, he may have been a few years older. Yeah, what I've always thought. I would always say like twenty, maybe. Yeah, yeah, nineteen, like, and she was probably fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, and so still good. a little foreign. Yeah. But even my grandma was married at fifteen years old. Like it's just. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't Sorry, I was just curious because I forgot. No, I've yeah. heard like, that from a lot of sources. That was probably I was a bit. actually wondering the same. Yeah. Oh, cool. we, we all have that question. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Good, good question. So, you know, Mary hits her mid to late teens, maybe Joseph, 19, 20. It's time to get the contracts signed up. Joseph, you're going to go prepare a place. We're going to do this whole engagement time phase. And you guys know about how long Jewish engagements last? About a year. Right at a year. Yeah. So. And this is the whole thing. These two are going to get married. We've already signed the contracts. We're ready to roll on it. Joseph, it's your job to go and get the little hut built that Mary and you are going to live in and get everything ready. This is the exact thing that Jesus is going to play on in John 14, right? I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And where I go, you cannot come, but I will come back and get you. Jesus is playing on the Jewish marriage ceremony system. It's it's really interesting when they're Mm -hmm. doing all of this. So, all this legal process has started. There are contracts signed. There are I's dotted. 
And what happens? Surprise. <laughs> Sur <laughs> surprise, Joseph. I'm pregnant. And does Joseph believe her? Because she's pregnant? It, well, does he believe? Well, she, <laughs> I, 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 I think so. Because so. does, does, she says, from the Holy Spirit, does okay. Joseph believe her? Oh, from the Holy no. Spirit. No, he doesn't. He, he, Joseph does not believe her. Joseph is adamantly convinced that she's lying because it takes an angel to come to Joseph and say she's not lying. Well, I mean, to be fair, it's never happened before. Yeah. yeah. You know, but and never had any sense. Yeah, and, and no one yeah. would have believed her. Um, so, so understand. <laughs> This, this whole thing is incredibly humiliating, it's inconvenient, uh, it's, it's halting a process that has been years in the making, like, th this is record scratch noise, hit the brakes, everything's flying off the rails, and how many people in Nazareth are going to know about it? Everybody. Immediately. Because it's 500 people. Yeah. You know, Portalis is significantly bigger, and it functions on, like, the same thing, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Because this is what, what we do. So this person talks to this person. Well, Joseph, I, I was going to be in their wedding. I heard that. And he's just running around in circles. And so what, what is this? This whole thing of, of how Jesus was born. It, it's a scandal. Mm -hmm. Is it L-E-E-L? A-L. There we go. Gosh, I need help with this, man. It's It's scandal. And that's really interesting. Because we're talking about the God of the universe who is absolutely perfect and everything he does has always been eternally perfect, will always be forever eternally perfect. And the way he enters the world is through scandal. scandal. Mm -hmm. and, and as much as we decorate it up at Christmas time, and as much as we talk about how glorious the nativity story is, and it is, if we overlook scandal, we miss the story. Because mm -hmm. it is scandalous. Mm -hmm. Like, should probably make us a little a little uncomfortable on on that. And yet Matthew writes it. So why does Matthew include scandal? That's how it happened. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's it's historical. Uh, this is an, an apologetics thing. Um, if you go and you read, and I don't know why I do this, I like to bang my head through walls sometimes. So I'll go read, you know, like atheistic accusations or critiques of the Bible and what a lot of atheists will say, like Dawkins says this and some other people will say. What Matthew's doing is he's actually just adopting a Greek influential concept of someone being born of a god and a human. Because that happens all the time in Greek or Greek oh, mythology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Matthew's just saying, if I put this in here, it'll help us reach our Greek audience better. So Matthew just made this whole thing up to help reach the Greeks. And that's that's what they'll say. Um and I feel like that's totally missing mm -hmm. what, what's going on. Because, so, um, oh, what is it? Achilles was, like, born of the Roman goddess of the hunt and a Roman centurion. Like, that was how Achilles came to be. And so he was this mighty demigod warrior. And so, mm -hmm. so that's, that's Matthew kind of making that same claim. But if Matthew was making that claim, the story of Achilles is to do what with Achilles? Win a war. Give him power. Okay. Give him authority, right? Mm -hmm. So in Greek thought, when, when Achilles comes to be, he's going to have power and authority. How much power does Jesus have out of this story right here? And we know Jesus has authority over everything. But just in this little story, how much authority do we find given to Jesus? None he's just born in scandal. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, yeah. it is not a, this is not a story of power. Mm -hmm. It's not a story of, of ability. It's not a, a story of influence. Mm -hmm. It is a pure story of scandal, which is going to start raising all of these, these moral questions. So, I ask this one, why, why is Matthew comfortable with scandal? Well, one, because it's historical. If, if Matthew was waking this whole thing up, man, like, why would you not be like, and Jesus came, born in the palace, and was the king of if you were trying to give Jesus credit, you wouldn't use morally uncomfortable situations of a pregnancy out of wedlock and this little town in Nazareth and this confrontation of Joseph doubting and an angel had that. All of it is scandalous. And I think Matthew is intentionally saying, this is what happened. And it's historical. Not only is it, is it historical, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but it's biblically accurate. And here's, here's what I mean by that. 
So what's the very first thing the Spirit does, first action of the Spirit? I'll, I'll back up. Where is the first reference to the Holy Spirit in Scripture? The Spirit hovered in the Genesis 1. Yeah, Genesis 1, 2. Um, or 1, 3. The, the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit hovered over the deep. That's mm -hmm. the first idea. And so if you take down, I did this a sermon over this a while back, the, the tohu vavohu. I love that. Hebrew is so fun. Um, wild and waste, formless and void. It's this idea of... You, you get this giant ball of like murky chaos waters, and like what's what's living in that? Nothing, because yeah, life can't live in that. There, it's it has no way of sustaining or starting life. And so, what does the spirit do? Hovers over it, and it calms it. It it prepares it to start creating life and then God's going to take God the Father takes the calm water and he splits it and he brings up land and plants and animals and all this other stuff the spirit is preparing a barren place unsuitable for life to give life so I don't mean to be like over but is Mary's womb suitable for life it, it doesn't it doesn't have the ingredients necessary for life it doesn't. It doesn't, right? It, there is no way that just life spontaneously exists in a situation like that mm -hmm. unless the Spirit does what the Spirit has done from Genesis chapter 1. Mm -hmm. I don't think Matthew is trying to play on the Greek concept of demigods at, at all. Matthew is playing on the Genesis 1 concept of the Spirit does what the Spirit has always done. It's, it's a consistency. It's giving life. It's creating life. I shouldn't say it, sorry. He. The Spirit is a he. If I were in theology, my professor would have felt me on this presentation just for that. <laughs> Get your theology straight, Philip. So, so this isn't some, I say all that to say, this isn't some like weird relationship between God and Mary. And, and people have said stuff like that, and mm -hmm. it's not. This, this is the Spirit acting according to his eternal character, coming into a place that is lifeless, and cannot in itself sustain or create life, and the Spirit himself making it able to have life. This is how Jesus comes to be. And that's why Matthew is willing to embrace the scandal. Because he's saying, this is what God set up from the beginning. This is historically accurate, and it matches from Genesis 1 all the way till now. Um, so yeah, questions over that? I know I'm kind of just talking at this point. But... And we'll get into some other stuff too. I just wanted to set all this up. Okay, so... Mary goes to Joseph, man, I'm pregnant. Joseph's going to go quietly divorce her. And, and again, he's saying, Nazareth's only got 500 people. They're already going to know if I drag her out in the middle of town, I don't want to be mean to her, but this isn't going to be what we need to do. And so he, he kind of goes, and that's when the angel appears to him and says, nope, you're going to do this. And not only does the angel say this is true, but what, is, what does the angel do in verse 21? She will give birth to a son. And guess what Joseph is now supposed to do? It's Joseph's job to name Jesus. So what's the angel doing? He's saying, you have a part in this too, Joseph. You have a role to play in this whole thing. You're not going to be the biological dad, but it's going to be your job to name him. And I think this carries the, the influence of raise him and train him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of this is going to be on you. And you're just, I could imagine, like, what does that look like? Hey, here's how this is all going to happen. And I'm going to trust you to raise this child. What? What happens if Jesus knows how to do carpentry better than me just because he's the son of, you know? But, so, so Joseph, Joseph does all of this. But here's, here's what I think is cool and some things that I think we need to reckon with and think about through all of this. Um, and to do it, you kind of have to know a little bit of Hebrew, so we'll play with the Hebrew some. But uh, she will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Okay, is Jesus how they would have pronounced it in Hebrew? No. No. Do you guys know how they pronounce it in Hebrew? Jesus. 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 <laughs> it's not Jesus. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeshua. Yeah. Yeshua. Actually, 
And, and this is it. This is actually a shortened Hebrew from, it, it was, other people were named Yeshua. Um, there are people in the Bible named Yeshua. Because really, if you transliterate this to English, you would come up with Joshua. Joshua. Um, the reason it all changed is because what happened is this went to Latin, and then Latin went to other languages, and, other, and then finally it got to English as Jesus, and it's just this whole process. But So we didn't do a direct transliteration there. Um, but the name in its entirety is actually Yehoshua. And it's the same thing. We do the same thing today. If you say Yehoshua over and over again a bunch of times fast, what do you start saying? Yehoshua, 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 Yehoshua. You yell Yehoshua's name enough, you eventually just start saying Yeshua. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it is. But this is a uh, Hebrew com compound word. So, Yeho, which is an abbreviated form of, you guys know? You can stab at it, you're going to get it right. Or, or even if you just took an abbreviated form of, yeah, it's the same thing. We do, uh, we do this in the word hallelujah. The end of hallelujah. So hallelujah means praise. If you're going to do King James Version, praise ye. What does hallelujah mean? If you're not saying sing the song, praise ye the hallelujah. Yeah. Okay, well, you took us a long way to get to that point. I'm <laughs> Sorry. Fair enough. You can spell Jewish words, but you can't spell them. I know. I know. <laughs> Well, the thing is, you just don't know on these ones, so I don't have to worry oh, so about you it. Don't know, you don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so this is the, it's a shortened version of the Hebrew word Yahweh, is what it is. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, or Yeho is shortened for Yahweh. And so, um, and, and this is where, if we played with this a little bit, um, if, you want, if you're curious about. Hebrew, right? You read, you read Hebrew this way. Um, this is a yod, and this is going to be like a silent, soft H sound, a het. Um, and this is what's called a W-A-W, -W, but depending on who your Greek or Hebrew professor is, they'll pronounce it just either wall or vav. just depends on who, who you have in het. You guys didn't know you were going to get the Hebrew lesson today. Um, and, and in the ancient Hebrew texts, they didn't have all the dots and stuff under it. Uh, that wasn't added in until later, that they added in the vowels, so this is just consonants. And so there's some debate about how do you pronounce this. Some people will say this first letter should be pronounced Y. Some people will say this first letter should be pronounced J. Um, and this is going to be like a A, H, like A ah, in some way. And then they'll say the Vav should be W. Some people will say it should be V. And then again, kind of like an AH type thing. Um, so the way some people pronounce it is, sorry, now I'm doing it in mirrored form. Yahweh, and some people will call it Jehovah. Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just different pronunciations of the same word. And <laughs> you're trying to read an ancient text that no one speaks it in that way anymore. <laughs> like, good luck, you know. Mm -hmm. So people land in different places. But most of modern now theologians have come, come to Yahweh. That's, that's the name given to the God of Israel, the God that we serve, the one true God of the world, Yahweh. This is every time you read your Bible and it's translated Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitals. You guys probably know this. Um, so Jesus' name is, is going to be Yahweh. And then this term Shua, which I won't ask you about that. Do you guys want to guess, though? Saves. Yeah, it saves. Yeah, you got it. So, wh what is Jesus' name? The Lord saves. Yeah, Yahweh saves. That's, okay, Joseph, you're going to have a son, and you are going to name him Yahweh saves. <laughs> that's, that's, so, here's, here's the question. Verse 21. Um, let, let me just pronounce it this way. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Yahweh saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Mm -hmm. So who saves the people from their sins? Is it Yahweh or Yahweh saves? I know, right? 
Who who is it that saves? Yahweh or Yahweh saves? Whoa. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> no, not at all. And that's that's my point. That's my point. That already Matthew is is bringing you to this point of asking, wait a minute, is it God who saves or Jesus who saves? And Matthew, I think his answer is yes. It is Yahweh saves who saves, and it is Yahweh who saves. Because guess who Jesus is? The embodied form of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. He is Yahweh in flesh, God the Son, right? Matthew is already building into the Trinity. Now, does Matthew come out and say, hey, let me go ahead and give you guys a theological covenant? Did it go off, or is it still going? No, I'm just joking. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, you're good. Um, you know, is Matthew coming and saying, all right, guys, we've got a theological treatise here that you guys need to sign on to, that Jesus exists as uh, God the Son, and no, he's not doing that. And it's not bad that those things come later. I think they needed to be. But Matthew is very intentionally just coming in and saying, Jesus is God. It, I think it's the claim right here. You shall name him Jesus, and he will save. You shall name him Yahweh save, and he will save. Wait, wait, which one? Yes. He will save. So I think Joseph is starting to grasp the, the gravity of this. Now, does Joseph fully understand it? I don't know. I, I don't know how much Joseph gets, but I think there's got to be this thought of, how does this all play out? What's the end result? How does how does this happen? And so, there's my question. Who saves? Yahweh or Yahweh saves? Both. Um, and then, he's going to clarify that a little bit more in verse 21. She'll give birth to a son, and you're to name him Yahweh saves, because he will save his people from their sins. So, who who saves? And then, I'm just like all over the board here. I'm going to find this one. Uh, and, and who does he save? So who who is that? If you were curious, Matthew has already given you a list of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Matthew's saying, and he will save his people. Who is that? Go go look at the genealogy. You'll find it. Like th there it is. Now, that's kind of interesting because us in modern day America want to come out and yell, What about us? Right? Like, what do you mean he'll save his people? I want him to save me. I, I don't know. Like, I maybe if I did enough research, could find that there's some cultural Judaism in my <laughs> genealogy. But if there is, it's not much. Um, my family is redneck Tennessee. That's what we are. Um, so, so why is Matthew saying, and he will save his people? And I think to play with that well and understand that, you have to understand the claim of what God's intention was from the start of humanity, and how that not that he failed, but humanity failed. And how he interacts with that down this lineage that Matthew's already given us. So, um, Matthew starts his lineage here with Abraham, but is that where the Bible starts? No. So, we, we could go back and we could actually start with Adam. And God puts Adam and Eve in this garden and gives him this command. You're going to tend to it. You're going to live in perfection. You're going to reign over this garden. Rule with me. Um, I will be the king, and you will be right here as, as you just take care of this garden. One rule, don't eat of that tree. And they do, and they give up their rule and reign as God intended man to have and fall into sin, and so pass or fail. They fail. To totally fail. So, what, is, what does God do after Adam fails? There's other stuff in this. I'm, I'm going quick mode here. Um, but he is going to call out one particular family. So this, this one person didn't do it. So now I'm going to call out this one particular family. That's the family of? Noah. Well, I was thinking Abraham. Yeah, Noah. You're right. You're right. But I was I was skipping over Noah for time's sake. There is exactly <laughs> no way. Do what? How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm you know, sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I finally thought I was going to get a question right. I'm sorry. I'm skipping now. Yeah, I'm skipping. Fun. So, so God selects. Yeah. I should I should print off a copy of my notes and then you guys can just say. It. Um. So so God comes in. He calls Abraham out of Ur. Uh, he he blesses Abraham and his family. He rescues them. He serves as their king. He he gives them instructions whenever it goes down to Moses. Um, as to how they should live to bless everyone else. Because what's, what's the promise to Abraham? 
Those who curse you, I will curse. curse. And those who bless you, I will bless. So, so the whole idea is, hey, Adam, you were supposed to bless the world through ruling and reigning with me, and you failed. So now I'm going to give Abraham this opportunity that his family can bless the world through trusting in me and following me. And so you go generation, and does Abraham pass or fail? Mm-hmm. He, he, he doesn't do it perfectly. And he does some good things, but yeah. still falls short. And you could go down and trace it all the way through Isaac, Jacob, keep going, right? And you'll find fail, 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 fail. Dysfunctional, Dysfunctional brokenness. It's, we're going to set you apart, and they're like, I'm going to marry 17 women. And that's, you know, this is how the Bible goes. Great idea. Yeah. So what, is, what does God do? Uh, is, is Abraham's family a blessing to all the nations in their own ability and their own power? No. no. They don't ever have the chance to, to do that. They fail in blessing the other nations. So God is going to then call out of this family one, one line. You guys know what we, we titled this line of I hope it's David. It's David. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an answer. I got You Yeah. So, so, and Judah, but Judah by, and then God renews it all to David when David takes the throne. And so David is kind of, if you, I think, were to go back and ask like a Pharisee, where's the Messiah going to come from? They would say David. Mm-hmm. It's that lineage. That's where that's where this whole thing starts. You were looking for Judah, though, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I was actually looking for David. I, I, I was I was looking for I was looking for David. So God God calls out this lineage of kings out of David, and these these kings are going to be commissioned to lead the nation of Israel to accomplish this call of of being loyal to Yahweh and Yahweh alone to bless the world as they are loyal to to Yahweh. But they and, fail. Pass or fail. <laughs> In just two generations. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you get their lineage splits because oh you get Judah and Israel and you keep walking down. And of those, it's just like failure after failure. And every so often you'll get one little like spark of a good king. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like, and then the next person became king and murdered babies. And yeah. it's like, okay, well, mm-hmm. good try, you know. So the question is, how is this global crisis resolved? Because if you were to identify the one thing that marks all of these stories, I think it has to be this concept of failure Mm -hmm. in in a very hard and dark way that every time God comes in and offers a way for mankind to be restored, mankind finds a way to fail. Fail, 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 fail again. And and we have a word in our English Bible church that we use for fail. We call it sin. sin. Mm -hmm. Because that's what this failure is. It's sin. It's the failure to trust God to be who God says he is. It's the failure to trust God in his character and to say, I need to deal with this in my own way. And every one of them do it over and over again. So when, G, when the angel is promising Joseph in verse 21 that he will save his people, I think what it's doing is it's saying Jesus is going to save this lineage of failures. And David is going to save this family of failures. And David is going to save mankind of failure. So you trace it back far enough, you find that it does apply to the entire world. But it's going to trace back through that story first, Mm -hmm. then launch into the new world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is why Paul's going to come in in Romans 1.16 and say, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God that can save us all. First to the Jew, then to the Greek. So to say this is the trace that Jesus came back that brings forgiveness to all of this nation's sins and then it's going to burst open and, and the promise that was given to Adam the promise that was given to Abraham to bless the world, the promise that was given to David of an eternal king, all of it gets fulfilled right here in this guy named Yahweh saves oh, by the way, who is it that saves Yahweh or Yahweh saves? Oh, yes exactly, <laughs> welcome to the claim of, of Matthew Jesus comes to rescue Israel's kings from the failure, to rescue Israel as a whole from their failure, to rescue humanity from, from our failure. And this kind of opens this whole thing up then, that if we're, and we're just off of Matthew chapter 1. I won't draw on the board anymore, so I'll wrap up from here. Um, Matt, Matthew 1, what is the tone of Jesus? And Jesus hasn't said or done anything. But what is Matthew trying to tell us about Jesus? 
He's a baby. Yes. <laughs> Just kidding. You're right. Yeah. He's gonna save us. He's gonna save us. Mm -hmm. That what is the chief purpose of this Messiah that is yet to be born at this point in the story? Salvation to mankind. Mm -hmm. It it's not that Jesus was a moral teacher. He did teach morality. But it wasn't that Jesus was a moral teacher. He wasn't trying to create some new moral program that was going to be the new self-help book on the way that we can finally do this whole thing right. He was going to just save. Just boom, there's the stamp. I'm saving this, redeeming this, and, and promising this. The promise will save us from our failure. Now, we're good in a church to not pick up on this all the time. But usually we don't like that story. Because I want to be the success of my life. I want to look back and say, look at how hard I worked and everything that I accomplished. And the gospel comes in and says, you don't get to do that. Because anything you have that's remotely good, guess who gets credit for it? Jesus. Because who is it who saves? <laughs> yeah. He gets credit for, for it. And this is Matthew's claim. You want to know how to be saved? You want to know how to be redeemed from your sins? It means you have to get outside of yourself. And say, I can't do it. I'm trusting Jesus. Rescue and salvation can only come from outside of us. It can only come from Jesus. And, and the problem with that is, I, have you guys, uh, there was a campaign. People got bumper stickers. And this was back in the early 2000s, I think. Maybe early 2010s. And it was like, uh, be good. Be good to one another. Like, the whole premise is, like, if we could all just be good to each other, the world would be a better place and we'd all live happily ever after. So, like, yeah. you should be nice to your Starbucks barista. And, like, people got these, like, be good, be good. Guess, guess how much better the world got? No. no. It, it didn't, That's you know? Like philosophy. Yeah. Or, uh, I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm not trying to rag on these things. But uh, you guys remember that, that movie, Evan Almighty? Yes. And like mm -hmm. the build the ark, and then it's yes. like ark stands for acts of random kindness. Yeah. And that's how we're gonna fix the world. We're just gonna do acts of random kindness. It's like that's wonderful. Let's go do acts of random kindness tomorrow. And guess how much better the world will be? No. Mm -hmm. Because those things in this human philosophy of if we just try hard enough, and if we just be good to one another, and if we just do acts of random kindness, it, it fails to see the complexity of human depravity. I mean. Mm -hmm. I'm weighing into stuff that's weird, I guess. But, like, does Vladimir Putin think he's doing evil? No. I absolutely think he's doing evil. But yeah. if you were to sit down with him and just somehow have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, he would find some way to justify his cause. And in his skewed, broken heart and mind, mm -hmm. he would say, what I'm doing is, is right and good for the world. And Nobody thinks they're a villain. Yeah. Like, we, it, there are very few people in this world that are just like, I'm going to be downright evil. We call them sociopaths, and we yeah. Yeah. exile them from society as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, but but most, every, yeah, most everyone will find some justified reason for why they do what they do. And it keeps just sending us into the spiral of destruction. And be good is not the answer, and it cannot be the answer. And I think that's what Matthew's saying. It didn't work for Adam, it didn't work for Abraham, it didn't work for David. The only way it works is if Jesus comes, fulfills it perfectly, saves from sin, restores, redeems, and sets, and sets free. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the way I had it in my notes, saying, telling someone to be good is like putting a Band-Aid on a severed leg. Yeah. That was my, my notes there. So. Yeah. so how does Matthew know this? How, how does Matthew know that just telling people be good is not going to work? Because yeah, he met Jesus. Jesus. He's seen him. He, was he, was, uh, he studied history. And he, he oh, knew his Bible. Yeah. yeah. Matthew knew Jesus and he knew the Hebrew Bible. And mm -hmm. if you just take time, right, it says at the beginning, there's a lot of purple. If you're going to, what does this mean? And if you don't pick up on much of anything reading through the Old Testament, you can still pick up on, man, people are broken. Yes. Like, it does not take much. <laughs> a four year old can read the Bible and say, Mommy, Daddy, why do they kill babies so much? And you're just like, because we are broken beyond repair. Matthew knows this because he's read about it over and over and over. So he's read story and story after of humanity messing up and God saving them and humanity messing up and God saving them. So he comes in and he says, the angel tells Joseph, name him Yahweh saves. And this is the climax of everything. That Yahweh saves through Yahweh saves. And then you get to verse 22. 
Uh, now this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Emmanuel. And now you're like, wait a minute. Is his name supposed to be Jesus or Emmanuel? <laughs> like, which, which, which is it? Joseph and maybe Emmanuel was Jesus' middle name? It was Jesus Emmanuel Christ. That was, that was not Jesus' name. Now, wait a minute. You told us Christ wasn't his last name. Yeah, you're exactly right. I'm glad you picked up on that. I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, but again, we, we can say the same question, right? Because what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God, God with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Imanu is with us. El is God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's another Hebrew word for God. So God with us. And so now we can ask the question, oh, wait, who's with us? God is is it God with us, with us, or is it God who is with us? No. Yes. <laughs> Again, there it is. You know, is it Emmanuel who's with us or God? It's both. <laughs> it, it's the eternal Yes. And it's this whole story that Matthew's just right here in this little section, I think he's come out and said, the, the eternal God is not content with leaving humanity as a failed project. He's no desire of leaving us to rot in our sin, so he comes to do two things right here in Matthew chapter 1. To be with us and to save us. What is Jesus going to do his entire life? Be with us and save us. And then once he ascends to the right hand of the Father, what does he do? He sends the Spirit to do what? Be with us. Be with us. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's just matching this whole, the whole thing up. And, and so then, if this is true, that Yahweh saves, comes to save, and God is with us, comes to live with us, then, then who is God? It, it's not some abstract man upstairs. God, God's not like an old white man with a really long white beard. That reaches out and touches fingers with Adam. You went, yes, that painting. Mm -hmm. um, who is God? God? God is Jesus, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And the characteristics of Jesus are the same as the characteristics of Yahweh. And the characteristics of Yahweh are the same as the characteristics of Jesus because they are one in the same person. And so this is kind of where I've, I've been, and I've talked about this two weeks ago, Jesus-centric apologetics. Like, wh why do I believe God exists? Because I believe Jesus existed. And there are wonderful apologetic arguments for, for why God exists in creation, and that's wonderful. But, but I think if I were just pinned down and someone said, why do you believe in God? For, for me personally, the answer has to be Jesus. Because I think Jesus is undeniably a historical character. Mm -hmm. Anyone that says Jesus didn't exist are just downright wrong. You can't argue it. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but not only did Jesus exist, but he did something no other man ever did. And he fulfilled these claims of saving and being with mankind. So I believe Jesus existed historically. I believe he revived literally. And I believe he reigns e eternally. And so because of that, he's revealed the character of God to be the eternal triune God. And he lives with us. This, this is why I believe. And this is, I think, Matthew's claim of Matthew chapter 1. So, so yeah. Who, who is it? Who saves? Yahweh saves or Yahweh? Yes. Who is it who's with us? God with us or God? Yes. Welcome to Jesus. It's a great place. I don't know. You guys have thoughts? Oh, and, and I did this two weeks ago too. But Matthew, Matthew 28, God gives, Jesus gives a great commission, right? Um, so go therefore and make disciples of, of who? So, so Jesus came not just to, but now we're back to the all nations, all humanity. Baptizing them, so there's this transitionary moment of death to new life. We already talked about that some tonight. Transitionary moment of, of baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is tying it, tying it all up together. Mm -hmm. For Jesus is what? For I am with you always. What's the part that I skipped? Sorry. And teach them. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, you're right. I just skipped over part. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry. But but for, for I am with you. Who's with you? God or Emmanuel? And Jesus ties all this right back in. And Matthew's showing us this. So I think it's cool. You guys got any thoughts? Anything you would add to it? I have a thought. Um, yeah. So I was thinking when you, go, you were going over the name, and since Jesus is essentially a form of Joshua. Yeah. 
the first week when you were talking about the parallels between Moses and Jesus, I just thought it was really interesting and however many years ago when I first learned that yeah. Joshua and Jesus is the same the, name. The same name, yeah. I just think that's interesting because the person who was supposed to, who took over from Moses was to be Joshua. like the new Moses was Joshua and like neither of them He also did it. Yeah. And it's like here's another Joshua to actually fix it this yeah. time. Yeah. Is he going to get it right? Interesting. And this is Matthew's going to play on that exact same thing. Because if you've read the Old Testament and you start Matthew, you've seen story after story where people fail. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk a little bit more through some other stuff. But then you get to Matthew 4, and Jesus is going to go into the wilderness. And what's the question? Is Jesus going to fail? Mm -hmm. Because everyone else has failed. Is Jesus going to fail? And you get to the end of that chapter, and you realize, nope. There's something different about this guy. And that launches the rest of the book. It's it's fascinating in all of this. So, what time is it? Yeah, go for it. Kind of explain what you were saying, Trent. You know, when you think of it that way, and all you think about why did the people of Nazareth? I mean, the majority of the men, at least, had to have been. They were taught the Bible. They oh yeah, they, they knew this story. By age thirteen, they knew all of this. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, you're telling me that your son, who was born out of wedlock, <laughs> is going to be this different? Name. Yeah, and, and this different. Mm -hmm. You know how is yeah. he? How is he got you know which you know? Mm -hmm. And and we do that to yeah. ourselves all the time. You know, mm -hmm. we when we you know, my my dad used to say uh, when people would question him because my dad was a very godly man, but yeah. he got cancer, mm -hmm. and people came to him. You know, in town, mostly people who were not Christians, but yeah. came because my dad was not talking, mm -hmm. and they said, "Well, how could God let this happen to you? Mm -hmm. You're 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 dying." You know, I mean, they didn't say it exactly that way, yeah, but, that's but what Dad mean. always said, "Cause God just promised me life everlasting. He never yeah. promised me everything would be mm -hmm. easy here on Earth, mm -hmm. or it would be perfect, or that I would do everything right." And he would tell him, "Don't put me on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. you know? I got clay feet. I'll fall <laughs> oh, off yeah. every, every time. time. Every mm -hmm. time. You know, every time. You know, but but I, I don't know how many people." When he was so sick, we come and wonder, and they would question, "Why would God do this to you?" And God didn't do this to me. Yeah. The world did this to me. You know, uh -huh. this is just you this, know. This thing happened. called sin is yeah. rotting you us know, from within, yeah. no matter who we are, and we're all yeah. susceptible to it. And mm -hmm. and guess what? Jesus came to do. Yeah. Save us. Save us from that sin. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 That, that there will come a day where we get to live in the original intent of Adam and Eve, the perfection of. God and humanity in full restoration. And oh, it's beautiful. It's so good. Uh, let, me, let me pray for us. God, thank you for your goodness and glory. And uh, thank you that you save and, and that you are with us. Um, help us to see that, God. I know there are so many times in life that we can just fail to understand that. And, and as we jump into Matthew 2 next week, it already kicks us off into a story of, wait a minute, God, I thought you saved. What's going on here? Um, just to remind us that this promise is not a promise of an easy life. It's not a promise of things will work out the way we think or intend. It's a promise of you are with us and you will save us from our sins. And let us rest in those true truths of Jesus Emmanuel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's funny, the human part of this, though. I'm like, 